I'll invite you to have your Bibles handy and go ahead and turn, if you would, with me to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, this morning I'm going to present a host of concepts that I hope will help our church take, take a new step as a body of believers. As a church, uh, there are different ventures that we participate in together. We minister together. Some of the men have gone out with me door knocking and such. We uh, will have activities together. We'll, we'll do Bible studies together. We'll come together for many purposes. And one of the reasons why we do so is because this concept of corporate worship, of coming together uh, the, the, the concept of, of the whole being more than the sum of its parts, right? That there are things that we can do together that maybe individually not all of us can do just as, as single families or as, as single people. The old adage says many hands make light work and indeed it stands to reckon that a group of like-minded individuals is able often to do more together than to do so alone. And I hope today to walk you from kind of point A to point B to point C through a way of thinking, through a perspective on the nature of how God operates, of God's design, of how God blesses, and of how we as a church can be used as a part of a greater whole to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one of the things that to this point our church has not had is a, a fully focused or a fully established missions program. And one of the reasons why, and I'll present some of this today, is because of my personal um, struggles as a minister with some of how uh, missions work is done today, with the process of missions work. And I'll present that as we go throughout. Uh, however, I feel like it, we're getting to a point in our church where it's time to take a step. And so today I'm going to present a step that I would like for our church to take. And it's not a step that we're going to take today. Um, but as we walk through, I'm going to lay a biblical principle for us why we ought to be supporting missionaries, why we ought to, to care what missionaries are doing, why uh, we are, are interested in having them to our church, why we are interested in sending them out, why missionaries go from church to church and seek the funding to be able to go minister to others. And as we walk through that process, understand what the Bible presents, what the Bible teaches, I'm going to present at least the beginning, the foundations of a framework of how our church is going to hope to be a part of that system. Now to this point, this is what we have done. To this point, we've had missionaries come through. And as missionaries have come through, I've encouraged you to give liberally to them. And it has always been that way. Uh, our church has always done a great job of giving to the individual missionaries that have come through. And we've given them love gifts that oftentimes surpass what many churches would give to a, to the, to a missionary that they support full time uh, in any given year or maybe even in, in, in several years of time. And so we've been very good in that way. But then our giving has ebbed and flowed on the condition of how many missionaries we have come through, right? So if we have several missionaries come through, then we've given more as, as we've had more come through. If, if we only have maybe one or two in any given year that come through, then uh, we don't have as many opportunities to give. So what I'm hoping to do today is not just give you the biblical foundation, but then to normalize our opportunities to give a little bit so that we can, we can uh, make a more consistent and a, a more consistent effort toward helping missionaries on the field, while at the same time allowing the Spirit of God to still be an active part of the giving that we two do together. So I'd like to begin our time today in Philippians chapter 4. And in Philippians 4 verses 10 and 11 we read this. Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he has just encouraged them to trust and to obey sound doctrine, to lay all things before the Lord through prayer, and so to find peace. We are familiar oftentimes with Philippians 4, verses um, 6 through 8, right? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind. 
uh, through Christ Jesus. And as we understand that concept, then he says, whatsoever things are good, lovely, and of a good report, if there be any praise, if there be any virtue, think on those things. And that is where we find the context for this. He says, I rejoice greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. He says, wherever you were also careful, full of cares, but you lacked opportunity. So he's encouraging them to trust the Lord, to obey sound doctrine, to lay all things before the Lord in prayer, and so to find peace, to keep their minds trained on the things of virtue and of praise and of goodness and of purity and of justice. And in verse 10, he then leads us, switching gears a little bit into his own situation. He says, and this is my trial. This, is, this has been the area of life where I've had to really be careful for nothing, to, 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 to not have care over my own things. But praise the Lord, that's okay because you've been careful for me. I haven't had to be concerned about my own care, about my own concerns, because I lay them before the Lord. And as I lay them before the Lord, the Lord took the concerns that I might have for myself and gave you those concerns. So you've been careful for me. You've been concerned for me. That your care for me has flourished. And as I have lifted, as I have left these before the Lord and the burden's been lifted off of me, the Lord has, in a manner of speaking, taken my burden and placed it on you and given you the desire to care for me. And he praises the church at Philippi for this, who had flourished, he says, in their care for him. That they were concerned about him. That they felt a burden to take care of his needs. And notice that he says, that as he says this, he tells them that he doesn't speak in respect of want, that word meaning need. Uh, when, when David writes in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's not saying there, I don't, I, I'll, I'll never want something. He means there, I will never lack. I will never have a need that's not satisfied. And so he says here, I'm not speaking in respect of need. I'm not speaking in respect of, of, of God not having taken care of me. And he says, this is what I've learned. He's commending them for their care because, not because he's currently discontented with the situation within which he finds himself, or because he's worrying about his needs, but he says because he's learned to be content. He says, I'm not writing to you because I'm not content. I'm not writing to you because I haven't been content. In fact, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, to trust God for my needs. But then he continues in verses 12 and 13. He says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul says, I'm not speaking here in respect of, of need, of want. Uh, I know that I, I'm, I can be content, and I have learned in every situation to be content. And he says, I've been in every situation. He says, I've been called to be abased, to be mocked, to be scorned, to be ridiculed. And I've been called to abound. There are times where people received him with great gladness. In, in uh, uh, Asia Minor, at one point they thought he was a god. He, he, he has been abased and he has abounded. He says, I also know that I've been, I've been instructed to be full and to be hungry. I've had times where I've had plenty. I've had times, uh, times where I've not had enough. But in all of these circumstances, what I've learned is that God is going to take care of me and I need to be content. He says, so I'm not writing because I'm discontent. I'm not writing because I haven't, had what, uh, I haven't been provided for by the Lord. These, this is not what I'm, what I'm writing. He says, what I've learned is that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It's important to note the context of this very popular verse. You'll see this verse regularly, right? Oftentimes you'll see it. You'll, you'll see sports stars and on, on their little anti-glare patches. It'll say Philippians 4.13 like Tim Tebow's did in, in college. Or uh, um, Steph Curry, his shoe line has Philippians 4.13 on his, on, on his shoes. But the point of Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, really isn't that you can score a lot of points or win a lot of football games. What Paul was saying there is, I've learned that whether I have or I don't have, whether I am abased, whether I'm being made fun of and scorned and beaten, or whether I'm being honored, uh, I've learned that I can be content. That I can be content in all of these situations. That I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That Christ can give me the strength in the hard times. And that's really the context there of that verse. And, he, and, and he's confident in this. He says that 
in the times of suffering, I can live on the same plane of joy. I can live in the same level of contentment as my times of abundance. And I can do so because I know that God is in control because God supplies my needs, needs and God can empower me, give me the grace to do it. We just sang all the way my Savior leads me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Songs that remind us that in the hard times we have the grace. God gives us the grace to be content. And the point is that it's God's business. Paul says it's God's business where my money comes from, where my food comes from, whether I'm healthy, whether I'm sick. So he says, I'm just going to be content in the Lord. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to stay on his path. And I'm going to trust God for the rest. Notice what he says next in verse 14. Notwithstanding, he says, ye have done well that ye did communicate with my affliction. Paul says, I am content and I've learned to be content. I've learned that even when I don't have much, that that's okay. I can be content in the Lord. That's, that's the grace that God has given us. That's the call he's placed upon us. Even though I'm trusting God for all of my needs and to supply them. Paul says, notwithstanding, even, even though this is the case, Church of Philippi, you really did do a good thing by communicating for my needs. That word communicate in our King James Bibles, the English word, if you were to look it up in the Webster's 1828, I often define words in the Webster's 1828. It was the first Webster's edition, and Noah Webster used the King James Version uh, in, in a sense as a part of kind of his key. So the way that he defines the words there in 1828 uh, was similar to how the words would have been defined even back in, the, in seven, uh, 1611, and, and even specifically more so, 1769, which is the version that most of our King James Bibles come out of. So we use the Webster's 28 in order to, not just to get the, the, the modern definition of the day, but we use the Webster's 28 to get the definition as it would be understood in the King James Bible. Because those, that, those would be the words that when the translators put it down, they, they used with that, the intended meaning of the day. And we all know that words have changed meaning pretty consi uh, con considerably from 1769 to today. Um, so that if you look in a dictionary today, for certain words, you'll find a dramatically different meaning than if you were to look in a dictionary of those same words in 1828 and certainly 1769. So that word communicate in our King James Bible means to give to one another. Today, when we talk about communication, we're often talking about how we are expressing ourselves to another. Uh, and and we, we often speak of it specifically in the words that we say. So if somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, you're a good communicator most likely what they would be meaning is that my the way I speak or, or um, the, the manner in which I speak is clear or is good or is helpful to them. However, we know that communication is far more than just what we say, right? If you've ever taken a speech class or if you've ever done any communications uh, study, they say that statistically as much as 93% of our communication is nonverbal. When I was uh, studying to be a police officer many years ago, and we would do role plays where, in, in the role play, we would interview someone. And uh, within this role play, one of the things that we were taught to do is to look for nonverbal communication clues. Because if a person is standing there and you're talking with him one on one as a police officer, and you see those, the, you look, you watch their hands. If you see that the fists start to clench, you take a couple steps back. Because even if you, you don't know what's going on in their mind, but you can get a cue as to what's going on in their mind by looking at nonverbal communication. Uh, it's the same with a speaker. Uh, it's the same with, with, with uh, really any avenue of life. If I'm talking with someone and I'm like this, where I'm leaning back and my arms are folded, I'm what, what communicators call, this is a closed stance, right? I'm looking standoffish. And I'm, it's, it's not an open stance, it's not inviting. Whereas if I were to open myself up, put my hands at my sides, put a hand in my pocket, lean in a little bit, turn one side in, now I have an open stance and it's a far more friendly method of communication. These are things that you think about. These are things that, that there are, I mean, there are entire books written about this stuff. So when we talk about communication, we, even today, we're not just talking about what we say. But as we understand it in the King James Version, the idea of communicating with his affliction would be that which we are giving to another. Whether that's words, whether that is actions, whether that is um, uh, things. In the Greek, the word literally means to share fellowship 
or to co-participate. And what Paul is saying here is that the church of Philippi participated, felt, shared in, communicated with Paul's afflictions. They shared in his sorrows. They invested themselves in his efforts, in his goals, and in his needs. And Paul says, you as a church invested yourself in me, invested yourself in my joys, invested yourself in my sorrows, invested yourself in my health and in my well-being, invested yourself in my needs, invested yourself in my goals, invested yourself in my, in, in, in my intents. And you did well in that you communicated, and in this particular sense, with my affliction. You heard that I was in affliction and you felt that. You identified with that. You invested in that and you wanted to help me even though I wasn't among you anymore. He says this is a good thing. They had no obligation. He had left Philippi. He was no longer in Philippi. The, uh, they, they, but they took Paul's well-being and his, his ministry upon themselves and personally invested themselves in his activities and in his needs. And in doing so, Paul says, you did a good thing. That even though he was determined to be content, even though he was not worried, even though he knew that God would take care of him, yet through this church, he was made better. His state was improved. Life became easier for him. The church was a means of divine blessing and provision, even though he was not among them anymore. And take note of that last statement. That this support was not given while he was ministering to them, but while he was traveling around the world planting churches. Continuing in Philippians 4, Paul says in verse 15 and 16, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. This was Paul's second missionary journey when the Holy Spirit first commanded him to go into the region of Macedonia. He attempted to do it in his first. The Spirit did not let him. He goes to his second missionary journey and he sees what we call the Macedonian call, right? A man from Berea saying, come over here in a vision. And he says, I've been called. And he immediately heads out to go to Macedonia. Uh, Acts 16 verse 9 records this Macedonian call. And the concept will often be used by missionaries today. If, if you hear a missionary, as a matter of fact, the Smiths, they were the last missionaries to come. In his, in his video, he talked about that, right? That he heard the Macedonian call to go to the Republic of Palau. When you hear that concept of the Macedonian call, that was when Paul saw a vision, a vision of a man in Macedonia that says, come share the gospel. And many missionaries, uh, they, they don't necessarily see a vision of sorts, um, but what they do is they feel an intense burden for a certain people group. And they see that people group and they feel burdened for them and they feel as though that the Lord is telling them, go tell those people about me. And so they liken it to Paul's Macedonian call. Well, Paul responded to this call immediately and went into Macedonia. Acts 16 verse 11 tells us that his first stop was Neapolis, of which we know absolutely nothing about. And then in verse 12, we find uh, that he entered Philippi. In Philippi, we have the record of the first Macedonian convert, a woman named Lydia, who was a seller of purple. Uh, we also know in Philippi that Paul and Silas were imprisoned. If you recall, they were imprisoned. They were singing. The jails, uh, the, the, there was an earthquake. Uh, their chains fell off. The Philippian jailer was about to kill himself. They said, don't do that. We're all still here. The Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And he was saved and his whole, ha whole house was saved. Paul, however, would eventually leave Philippi, but he would stay in Macedonia. He would go to Amphipolis, then to Apollonia, then to Thessalonica, and then to Berea. Now, if you recall our time when we were preaching through Thessalonians, I've preached through both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. All of those sermons are online. If you recall that time in Acts 17, uh, he met heavy, heavy resistance in, Thessal in Thessalonica. They, were, they wanted to kill him. Uh, very heavy resistance. He was chased out of the city. And the Bible says that he ran out of the city and he went to Berea. Now, not everyone did. He left some folks in Thessalonica, but he went to Berea. And the Bible tells him that the people of Thessalonica were so hostile against him that they actually, when they found out he went to Berea, they actually chased him to Berea. 
And they started stirring up Berea against him. And so after Berea, the Bible says that Paul, leaving everyone else in Macedonia, fled, and he ended up fleeing to Athens. So Paul leaves Timothy, he leaves Silas, who is called Sylvanus in the text, in Macedonia, and they flee to, and he flees to Athens, a region in the region of Achaia. So he leaves Macedonia and he goes to Achaia. Now, what we saw in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 15 was Paul says, even after I departed Macedonia, you were still helping me. All right. So he goes to Thessalonica. He's in bad shape. But it, presumably the Philippians were hearing about him and helping him. Then he goes to Berea. The Bereans accepted him well at first. Right. The Bible says that they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was true. We often say we want to be like the Berean Christians because they were, they were those who studied and searched the scriptures carefully. Then he flees out of Berea because of the Thess Thessalonians and he goes to Athens. Well, in Athens, again, he was not well received, right? Uh, he uh, st stood up and he pointed to a, a, a monument to an unknown God and he preaches the message about the unknown God and they did not take it very well. And so he ends up having to flee Athens and head to Corinth. Uh, where, of course, we, we know that he was able to be established there quite well. He meets Aquila and Priscilla and such. So Paul leaves Philippi. He goes through the region. And he says that they communicated with him even after he left Macedonia, even after he went to Achaia, ministering briefly in Athens, comprehensively in Corinth. They were still co-laboring with him, sharing fellowship with him. That's what that word communicate means in the Greek, right? Fellow sharing fellowship. They were sharing fellowship with him by hearing of his needs and ministering to his needs. And we continue in the text, verses 17 through 19. He says, not because I desired a gift... But I desire fruit that may abound unto your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I love this. Paul tells them that they did very well. He says, you didn't have to do this, but you did very well in doing it. Not because I was happy to receive stuff. But because I know that by you co-laboring with me, sharing in my fellowship, in my ministry, riches will abound, spiritual riches will abound to your account. They did well in submitting themselves to God and being part of the blessing of, uh, of God upon Paul's work. And in doing so, they stored up for themselves eternal reward. This is what Paul calls fruit. That may abound to your account. In other words, Paul is saying this. He says, I'm, I'm happy that you sent to me my, for, for my, for, to, to meet my needs. But I'm not rejoicing specifically because this church gave him money and provision. Because one way or another, God was going to provide, right? That's, that's how God works. But he's specifically rejoicing for the church of Philippi because since they chose to give of their time and their money and their efforts and their prayers to the ongoing ministry of Paul around the world... They're going to be blessed by God in ways that they would not otherwise be blessed. That by giving to the needs of God's ministers, they're going to become more fruitful themselves. He says, I'm happy because you have fruit that can abound to your account. It was an odor of a sweet smell. That doesn't mean they sent him perfume. It means that their sacrifice unto the missionaries was a sacrifice unto the Lord. As in when, the, when, when, when a person would take, an, would take an animal, would put it on an altar, would light it on fire. And the Bible says that that odor going up was a sweet smell unto the Lord. Not because the burning flesh smelled good, but because it was obedience unto the Lord and that pleased the Lord. Paul says, what you did pleased the Lord. And then he uses this other verse, which we use all the time. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You gave to me, and now you can trust that God's still going to take care of you. This is how God operates. We give as God has called us to give, and as we give as God has called us to give, and we give bountifully, and we give joyfully, and we give cheerfully, we trust that as, as we're doing what the Lord would have us to do, that He's going to take care of us. And why? Well, as verse 19 says, because that's what God does. He supplies all their needs. Even though they've sacrificially given, God will take care of them. This was Paul's confidence. 
And to understand Paul's confidence in this fruit, I would like for us to go to some of his other teachings on giving, to kind of understand the concept of giving as Paul relates it. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, we'll be in Galatians for a few moments, and then we'll be going over to 2 Corinthians. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, Paul writes this, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Notice here we have that word communicate again. Co-fellowship. Work together to give unto. And he's speaking to those who hear the word of God. Commanding that it is their responsibility to co-labor with those who teach the word of God by meeting their material needs. And to prove this point, we need only go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. We'll be back in Galatians in a moment. But in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, uh, Paul says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So Paul explicitly commands that the church give to the needs of those who have been called by God to labor in word and in doctrine, to the pastors. And the point of the sermon today is, is not to, to preach about the, uh, the, the pastors and the responsibility of the church to the pastors. I've preached on that before. We'll preach on it again when it comes up in the text. Uh, but this is simply to understand the concept that Paul is presenting here. I give it to you as precedent so that you can understand what Paul is saying in Galatians 6. So he's saying, let him that is taught in the word, the, the people that listen, communicate unto him that teacheth, the teacher in, in good things. Notice then what Paul says next. Verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now we've often spoken of the sowing and reaping principle, and we understand that the sowing and reaping principle is a spiritual principle, right? So... It doesn't just apply to giving. But what is interesting about the sowing and reaping principle in the Bible is that the three prominent times it's taught, Galatians 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, and 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, all three times that it's, it's presented, it's given in relation to willingness to give to pastors. To give of the physical needs of of the physical provision that you have in order to meet the needs of the man who's giving spiritual provision to you. So Paul says in our relation to giving to others, we will sow, and what we sow is what we will reap. We reap what we sow. Take careful note. This has been grossly misused in broader, broader Christendom today, especially among the thieves that operate uh, in larger churches, televangelists and such, they speak of seed money. And what they do is they say, you plant your seed of, and then they give all the suggestions, $10, $100, $1,000, $10,000. You plant your seed, and then we'll pray for you, and we'll bless you, and then you'll become rich. And if it doesn't happen, they say it's because you didn't give enough, or because you don't have enough faith. And they ask for seed money. And they're always asking for seed money. You give your little bit and it's going to be multiplied unto you. That's a perversion of this concept. It's a perversion of this concept. It's them seeking money. And using the spiritual concept of sowing and reaping to fill their pockets. This evil Paul warns about in Titus chapter 1. Verses 10 and 11. He says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. If they were teaching the whole counsel of God, then they'd probably lose their audience. But they never have to worry about that because all they're really teaching about is seed money. So Paul gives warnings about these types of people. We find warnings about them as well in 1 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy and Jude and 2 Peter. All pointing towards not just men, but these women as well. That's not quite the concept here. Let us always remember that most often heresy and false doctrine do not come to the church openly. They don't come, in, they, 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 they don't come as full error. They come in the guise of truth, right? They come using truth's words. 
So they come under the guise of the sowing and reaping principle, but the sowing and reaping principle is not about reaping. It's about sowing. It's not about me manipulating God by giving, right? So I'm going to give a check for $1,000 so that I can manipulate God into giving me back 10000 That's not how it works. That's, that, that's, that's not the sowing and reaping principle. That's the seed money principle. You give to me and then that'll force God to give to you. But that's not the sowing and reaping principle. The sowing and reaping principle is I am investing myself in the spiritual, not the physical. Are you investing in the spiritual if the only reason you're giving is to get more back? No, you're still, you're still investing in the physical, aren't you? If the only reason why I'm investing anything physical is so that I can get health or wealth or prosperity, then I'm simply exchanging one physical for another, and that's not the sowing and reaping principle. That's just a barter. That's me saying, God, I'm trying to buy your blessings. God doesn't work that way. The sowing and reaping principle is I am laying aside the physical for a spiritual blessing. That I am elevating the spiritual above the physical trusting the Lord to take care of my physical and I'm pursuing the spiritual. And that's the sowing and reaping principle. That's when Paul says you need to be willing to, to, to communicate to ministers. He's not saying because ministers deserve a bunch of money. As a matter of fact, a minister that desires a bunch of money is not qualified to be a minister. He's saying that you are investing in a man who is investing in you. You are giving to his physical needs so that he can give to your spiritual needs and he can invest more in the spiritual. And so you are pursuing the spiritual by investing in him so that he can give you more. You're elevating the spiritual by giving of what you have physically to, to learn more and so that he can invest more in the study of the word of God and in prayer. So we dare not resist the principle of sowing and reaping because it's been abused. We need to understand that there is a spiritual blessing given by God to those who give to others. We need to understand that God does provide for the needs of those who give with a heart of cheerful obedience. And let me prove this to you. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul exhorts the Corinthian church to be prepared for an offering that he was going to take, this time for the needs of the people in Jerusalem. So the, the, the people in Jerusalem were in bad shape. Uh, they were being persecuted for their faith by the Jews, the, the Christians in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. They were going through a famine at the time as well. And so there was a famine, there was a recession, and they were being persecuted, so they were not able to get jobs. And the believers in this region, having become out Cast were really in need. And so Paul was determined to take an offering. And he went through all the churches of Asia, Macedonia, Achaia, to take an offering to give to the saints, to give to the church at Jerusalem. And he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. What Paul is saying here is uh, to the Corinthian church. Remember, the Corinthian church is in Achaia. And he's writing to them and he says, did you hear about the churches of Macedonia? That they're not very wealthy, that they've been struggling too, but that they really gave a good offering for Jerusalem. Did you hear about that? That's what he's telling the church at Corinth. He says that, that even in their trials and their afflictions, and remember, Thessal Thessalonica was in bad shape. People were dying there if you read First and Second Thessalonians. They were in bad shape. And he says, but they abounded in their liberality, in their, in their giving. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. They gave not just to the extent that they could, but beyond the extent that they could, praying, with, uh, uh, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Paul literally got the gift and he said, no, that's too much. You can't afford that. And they said, please take this for, for the church in Jerusalem. Please take this for them. And take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Let us be a part of their ministry down there in Jerusalem. And this they did, not as we hoped, 
but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us the will, by the will of God. In so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Paul says, they were so good, we decided that we're going to have Titus encourage you to do the same. And so, Corinthian church, you abound. The Corinthian church was a gifted church. They had a lot of gifted people. You abound, he says, in faith. You've got a lot of faith. You've got utterance. You're, you're very well spoken. You've got knowledge. You, you've, you've studied well. You're diligent. You, you, have, you have shown your love to us. He says, now abound in this also. Give with all that you have to these churches in Jerusalem. Give of everything that you've got to them. I speak not by commandment, he says, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. And to prove the sincerity of your love. He says, I'm not forcing this. This is not apostolic decree that you shall give. He said, this is me asking you to love the Lord by loving the people in the church in Jerusalem. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you, who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform this doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be a first the willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Paul says, have a willing mind, be willing to give, and then see what God might do through you. He is not commanding them to give. Their money is their own to do with what they will. But he challenges them to prove the sincerity of their love for Paul and for the saints through obedience to God, through sacrificial giving to the needs of others. And notice at the end of the passage how many times he invokes their personal will. As was their readiness to will, so may be a performance of that will. And the final verse means that it's not as much about the amount that's given as it is about the willingness and the love with which they pour out their giving to them. Now I'm going to skip a few verses and move into 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So just one chapter ahead where we continue to round out our understanding of, of Paul's instructions of giving. And he says this, uh, I'm sorry, that says chapter 8 verses 1 through 15. It's chapter, no, it's, it's, it's chapter 9 verses 1 through 15. My apologies there. He says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I seen the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I say, ye may be ready, lest happily, if, of Macedon if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had, notice, uh, ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth, purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, ha always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work as it is written. He hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for you, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruit of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which God causeth us thanksgiving, which, which causeth us uh, through us, excuse me, thanksgiving to God for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men and by their prayer for you which long after you for, exceeding, for the exceeding grace of God in you Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Uh, a lot happening there, obviously. I read the entirety of uh, 2 Corinthians 9. But within this passage, what Paul is saying is this. 
we've been bragging about you. We've been bragging about your liberality to those in Macedonia. They gave really well and we've been bragging about you. And what I don't want to happen is when we come and we find that you didn't give much at all, that, that, that we would be ashamed of our bragging and that you would be ashamed of our boasting in you. He says, so give. He's putting some pressure on them here. He says, we, 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 are, we are expecting this. It's not, not by command. You give with cheerfulness. You give according to the Lord. But God wants you to give. He says, as every man calls, let him, as every man purposes in his heart, let him give. Not grudgingly, not of necessity. But know that God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Know that he that, 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 that he that sows is the one that's going to reap. He puts some actual pressure on them here saying, I do, I do desire this of you. And the more you're willing to step out in faith and give to the needs of others, the more you can expect God's grace. I hope you see the principles here. I've attempted to lay out several principles. We started with the, what, what Philippi did for, for Paul and how Paul said it was right and it was good. And then we went to the sowing and reaping principle in Galatians chapter 6. And then we saw how Paul uh, desired to express that to the Corinthian church. And how it was about their will. And how this is not a command. This is not a, a, an obligation. But it is an opportunity. And the expectation that he placed upon them. Now with all of this in mind, I want to go through five points. That help us understand how this relates to our church and how it relates to missions giving in our church. We're going to have a couple missionaries next week. And as always, we're going to take uh, um, offerings for them. We'll have one in the morning, one in the evening. We'll take an offering in the morning. We'll take one again in the evening. And then we'll split that half and half between the two missionaries that come. Unless you, know, you want to particularly designate for one or the other. But as we do, and, and, and that'll be normal, but, but then I'd like to start something a little bit more, and I'll present to you what that is as we get toward the end. So, missionaries. The point of this message today is to connect the biblical principles, excuse me, of sowing and reaping to our opportunities as a church to support missionaries that go around the world to share the gospel. Now, those of you that have been in independent fundamental Baptist churches before are perhaps familiar with the concept of faith promise giving. The concept of faith promise giving started about a hundred years ago, and it was a means of encouraging God's people to give to missions work around the world. Faith promise is a method of partnering with the Holy Spirit of God to support missionaries in their endeavors to reach the world with the gospel. And in a faith promise giving system, every year the people in the church receive a commitment card, and they are asked to pray about how much the Holy Spirit would lay upon their heart to give for that year beyond their regular church giving, and then uh, they can either give a one-time, a monthly, or, or, or a weekly uh, amount toward that commitment. In a faith promise system, the promise is not made to the church, it's made to God. And in a proper faith promise system, it's not necessarily tracked. They don't hold you accountable to whatever you wrote on that card or anything of the sort. The commitment cards are a baseline so that the church is able to understand how much of a commitment they've received so that they can then make commitments to missionaries based upon how much they've received. In fact, in the past 100 years, a vast majority of what missions work has become revolves around this system that we would call faith promise missions giving. This is why missionaries come through our doors. Because they're traveling from church to church, seeking small portions of support, asking churches to partner with them and to commit to them a regular yearly sum of money toward the amount that they need on any given year, in order to live, in order to function in the other country without being beholden to the people unto whom they are going, to communicate to their needs while they travel around the world preaching the gospel. The precedent for this rests upon the passages that we studied this morning, that though Paul was not in the church, yet the church of Philippi was still communicating with his needs time and again, and in doing so, Paul says it was a good thing. They gained spiritual fruit. And as we studied the sowing and reaping principle, a desire and a willingness to give, all of these principles were met in their efforts to sustain Paul along his way. So we've come to the process called deputation. And that word deputation literally means a group of people appointed to undertake a mission or to take part in a formal process on behalf of a larger group. Missionaries travel around the world looking for a group of people that are willing to take part in the process of sending missionaries onto a larger group. 
so, so that's the idea of missionaries. That's why they come through our doors. They're presenting their ministries. They want our prayers. But they, they are asking us to, to see if we'd be willing to partner with them regularly. So now let's talk about deputation and the process of deputation. Deputation is the process of missionaries getting enough money to sustain themselves on the field of their burden. By gaining support from sending churches, the missionary is able to go to the field and ask nothing of those unto whom they minister. Now, once again, there's a precedent for this. This is exactly how Paul ministered from, uh, from time to time, at least. He discusses this extensively in 1 Corinthians 9, that he never asked a penny of the people, particularly in Corinth. He never asked anything. He says, I had the right to as a minister, but I never did it. I never asked of you. And that's the precedent whereby many of these missionaries, they don't ask of the people that they're going to. They go and then they're supported by churches back home so that they don't have to necessarily be supported by the churches there. And then they plant churches and they install uh, national pastors and then they move on and plant other churches. And that's often what missionaries are doing. Uh, and they're being provided for by the people uh, in the more lucrative area of the world, that would be the United States, particularly the Western world. In many cases, ca cases, missionaries are forbidden by their sending church or missions board to go to the field of their choice until they've reached this full support. They're required to have various levels of insurance uh, while they're over there. They have to go through the process of, of getting a green card and, and of being able to stay and, and of being in a foreign country and all of those different things. Uh, they have regulations that are put in place they're required to take furloughs home. Many mission boards ask them to take furloughs, uh, to come home, to, tell, uh, to, to report back to their churches, to get some time of rest. Um, they, uh, many of them mandate reporting procedures. All of these regulations are put in place to make the process of, of the missionary work smooth, uh, to protect them, to, to uh, uh, keep them safe on the field. Uh, much of this uh, arose from learning the hard way with the early 1900s in China Inland Mission and how many missionaries were killed in China during the, the Cultural Revolution and the Communist overthrow and, and some difficult times and many missionaries dying. This process has built upon the expectation of deputation. That churches are going to commit themselves to regular monthly and yearly giving to missionaries for the extent of the years that they're on the field. And in doing so, those churches are sharing in the work. And they're sharing in the fruit, as we've seen in Philippians and 2 Corinthians. Missionary deputation is often a process of several years. Appealing to churches to catch a vision for that need. Uh, the great strength of deputation is that even a small church, if we could only give $10 a month, $120 a year to a missionary, we can be a part of still sending a missionary onto the field. And that's a great strength of, of the deputation process and the way missions work is done today. It is then expected that once on the field, the missionary would return and would, would report back the, the activities, would keep these churches in the loop. Paul and Barnabas did this. They went back to Antioch after their missionary journeys and they reported on what was done in the book of Acts. So let's talk about the advantages, the particular advantages to deputation and the process of missions work as it is done today. Well, firstly, financial support is spread across many churches. And because financial support is spread across many churches, that means if one church fails to meet the obligations that it has made, there's a strong base of support for the missionary still. You don't have to come off the field because your church can no longer support you, right? Because you have a strong base of churches. Uh, many churches giving a little bit of money. Secondly, it, it increases prayer support. Because they travel through all of these churches, and many churches are praying for them, and many churches are supporting them. Even, churches, or even missionaries we don't support, we pray for. And so it increases their, their prayer support. Thirdly, this opportunity to travel from church to church can help missionaries make contacts. It can help them learn how to uh, leave their earthly things behind as they spend several years living out of a van, uh, going to some churches that don't treat them well, other churches that might treat them very well. They have to learn how to deal with people. They see how other people do ministry. They gain ideas. And we actually are going to read a missionary letter tonight from the McKinleys who just got on the field. And one of the points they give in their missionary letter um, was widened comfort zone. Deputation prepared us to face new and different people and circumstances. 
right? So they faced people all over the country and they learned different circumstances, different people. Now their kids are, are, are familiar with strange, uh, strange beds and whatnot. And so perhaps the transition to Ireland was a bit easier for them. Fourthly, as we mentioned already, even small churches have the privilege to take part because we, our church could not necessarily afford to invest in a missionary full-time, effectively put a, a missionary on staff and make him a full-time worker, give him several thousand dollars a month uh, in order to be on the mission field, but we could give him several hundred dollars a month or several hundred dollars a year. So these are the advantages of the system as it is in place, but it's not perfect, and this is where your pastor has struggled. I've really struggled with the mission system, and this is why to this point we've not put anything in place. Let's talk the problems. Firstly, uh, on the missionary side, deputation can be a very difficult process as well. For every missionary I have had tell me that the time was wonderful and profitable, I have had missionaries as well tell me about exhaustions and frustration. It's also very inefficient. Especially in the digital age, as missionaries uproot their family for several years and travel several thousand miles to get money to pursue the call of God upon their lives, they spend the first several years of the, their called ministry going from church to church, telling each church the exact same thing, preaching similar messages, going from missions conference to missions conference. They're not on the field. They're not doing what, what, what they've been called to do. We've had several missionaries come through with small children and the effect on those families is difficult and noticeable. Imagine trying to teach and maintain schooling and discipline on an environment where you're on the road for two years. It would be a very difficult thing to do. And so the process can be a blessing, but it can also be very difficult for them. Now, Paul had learned in whatsoever state he was there with to be content. But it makes me wonder if there could just be a better way. And it really does delay the process of getting to the field. That though there needs to be a process of training, certainly, the constraints of mission boards, fi financial demands and such uh, can keep people away from the field for two or three years after they feel the call to go. So firstly, it can be very difficult for the missionaries, this process that we have today of deputation and traveling. Secondly, on the church end, the system is constraining as well. Faith promise is intended to be what I'll call a faith proposition. As the Lord lays it upon your heart, you give. But here's an important thing to understand about this constraints of the faith promise system. If we were to do a faith promise system as it stands, and you were to take your card, and you were to put a commitment on it, and we were to take that commitment of, let's say, let's say $500 a month was committed to come in, and we were to say, okay, now we have $500 a month with which to commit to missionaries. So the missionaries come in, and we, over the course of the missionaries that we have, say we're going to commit to five missionaries, $100 a month, to go to the field. And next year we do the giving cards and only $400 a month now comes in. Because circumstances have changed. The Lord has laid a different amount on your heart to give. Well, the problem with a faith promise system is that you have to expect that every year you're going to get as much or more in order to meet your commitments to the missionaries. Because faith promise is built on the basis of these commitments. Now... The concept as it stands is that as you do a faith promise system, you're expecting that the Lord is going to grow the church, that the Lord is going to bless the people in the church for their giving, and so that you'll be able to grow it every year. And, and so I understand the argument there. But I've, one of my struggles has been that if I, in my time of prayer feel compelled this year to give to the missionaries of our church, but then next year the Holy Spirit does not compel me to give to those missionaries again and compels me to put my assets into another area of giving, I'm now constrained because I'm a part of, of this obligation. And I feel as though in some ways it denies the Holy Spirit the freedom in my heart to give in the manner that 
the, to, to have the freedom to give in the manner that I believe he might lead me to give. Now, there are answers to this. As I mentioned, we trust the Lord. He allows us to meet those obligations. Many pastors do attribute the growth of their churches and the, to their strong commitment to missions giving, that, that God is growing churches in order to be able to meet the obligations of the missionaries. Uh, they say, uh, as the whole design implies, that our church steps out in faith and that God meets those needs and meets our obligations. And I can appreciate that and I understand that. God picks up the pieces. He takes care of the rest. I'm really not here to contradict that system. But it is a concept which concerns me for the church because I believe it constrains the church to definitive long-term obligations that we're not necessarily ca called to be obligated to. Paul specifically told the churches that he was not calling them to give to the church of Jerusalem under obligation. That Paul said to the Philippian church, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, but you have done well in that you've communicated. And what this system can do is it can put the church on autopilot. We had a, a church planter come several years ago. He's, he's uh, passed away now, Dr. Earl Jessup. And in, in our Sunday school for our missions conference, we went through every missionary that we had that we've been praying for. And I talked about the needs of those missionaries and how we can be praying for them. And he pulled me aside after the service and he said, I have never known a pastor who actually knew all of the names of the missionaries in the church and knew their needs. And I thought, well, if that's the case, then, then what are we doing? We're autom are we automating a system so that the people of the church are giving money to the church for missionaries, but they don't even know the missionaries who they're giving to. They don't know their needs. They don't, I, I grew up in a church with faith promise, and I didn't know the name of uh, hardly any of our missionaries. And I wonder if there's not a better system. However, the problem is this system is very entrenched. And that's where my struggles have come from. So where does that leave our church? And this is our final point. I've devised for now a middle ground intended to lead us perhaps into a better way. I have a vision of a multi-church engagement in mission support, which if the Lord leads would bring churches together, would make deputation more short, more joyful, uh, more, more direct. Um, I'm not going to present that vision today because it's still in the vision stage. But I have a direction that I want our church to go for now, where we are allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. We are investing in the individual missionaries that we'll be giving to, but we'll still be giving in a systematic way. Faith Promise is a system to help churches and missionaries based upon biblical principles. We've walked through the biblical principles this morning and have led us to a conclusion. The conclusions are, it is good for churches to communicate to the needs of missionaries, as the Philippians did to Paul. In response to a church's heart of generosity and love, whereby they willingly give to the needs of missionaries with determined and joyful giving, cheerfully and without constraint or demand, God blesses them spiritually so that everyone who sacrificially gives to the needs of others by direction of God can expect without reservation that God will bless them. And I want to make this opportunity available to our church as well. I don't want to constrain us in God's blessings. And so what we are going to do for now, and what I'm asking the church to get on board with, is that four times a year, quarterly, we're going to take an offering. In the weeks leading up to that offering, I am going to remind you of this offering and ask you to begin to pray about what the Lord would have you to give to missionaries. And trust that the Holy Spirit will lay an amount on your heart. And on that day quarterly, we are going to take an offering, as we've done in the past for missionaries, and we are going to collect that amount of money as the Lord has laid upon you to give. Lay your bank account, lay your, big, your piggy bank, lay your mattress stash before the Lord and say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And then when God says, if God says none, if God says all, if God says some, you do what he tells you to do. Your heart ready and willing to give, no matter what it is. Look for the number. When the year is finished, Legacy Baptist Church will take all of the money that we have collected, every, every penny of it from those four offerings, and we will add to it a percentage of the general budget from the church that the membership will decide upon. And we'll pull all of that money together. And then, we, and then the membership of the church will have the privilege, having heard all of the missionary letters, I read them every Sunday night, having them all on the back table, seeing the needs of the missionaries, knowing who we're praying for, knowing who might have needs, we'll start praying for the individuals that we know 
and what the Lord would have us to give and who the Lord would have us to give unto. And it will give us maybe one name, maybe two names, maybe five names. Maybe we'll distribute it among all, however many missionaries we have on that backboard. And then we will give as the membership is led to the needs of those particular missionaries out of the pool of what the Lord has provided for us. In doing it this way, we are able to trust the Lord, obey His promptings, give sacrificially, do all of those things that God has called us to do. We are able to co-fellowship with the needs of particular missionaries who might have particular needs for a particular time. Not only are we being asked to give with a heart of gladness and willingness, but we'll be invested in the missionaries into which we're giving in a more real way. And we'll see how that goes. Now, the obvious downside is that we aren't actually going to be helping missionaries get to the field, right? We're not changing the system. The system is still in place. Mission boards are still going to require that they get 100% commitment. We're not going to be a part of that regular commitment. So we're not helping missionaries get to the field, per se. They won't be counting on our church necessarily. We might give to a missionary every year. But they won't necessarily be able to count on it in a commitment sense. But we will be able to fill the gap that while there are many missionaries out there doing the deputation process and being a, being a part of, of, of that regular commitment, maybe our church will be one of those unique ones in the middle that has the funds necessary and ready to go for the particular needs of missionaries that go beyond what their regular support could provide for them. And I don't think that um, filling a different need necessarily is something that the Lord would look down upon as we meet the needs of missionaries around the world and seek to communicate with them. So where does this leave us today? Well, over the next couple of months, uh, next week, in fact, we have two missionary families come in. And every missionary family that comes in, we'll still take a regular offering for them as we do and give them an, and give them an honorarium and such. It allows your eye to affect your heart. But then, as I mentioned, coming up into October, we'll be will be gearing up to take an offering. And every quarter, we'll gear up to take an offering for what the Lord would have you to give to the needs of the missionaries. You can give them one quarter for the whole year. You can give quarterly. You could designate it every week, and we'll put it into the, into the amount, whatever you'd like to do. But may I encourage you to begin to think about how the Lord might be able to use you to meet the needs of missionaries around the world. And this is going to be a way for us as a church to build into our church a means by which for you to communicate to the needs of those missionaries who have come through. And I trust that the Lord will uh, use it greatly in our lives, uh, both to be a blessing to them and then to be a blessing to us as we see how the Lord has used it. Uh, let's close in prayer.